Welcome to Gym Nerd School 101 from the Institute of Gymcastic, the gymnastics podcast. Uh, today, we are going to do what you guys have been asking for for a long time, which is explain all the things that are still hard to understand, even for someone who's been listening to this podcast and watching gymnastics for a long time. And you'll learn along our journey today that this is also a problem for me, who has been doing this for a very long time. So this is episode five, 450, 450 of Gymcastic, the number one gymnastics podcast in the galaxy. I'm Jessica. I'm here with Spencer from the Balance Beam Situation. Many of the GIFs and videos that we are going to use today come from the Balance Beam Situation or come from our Gymcastic YouTube page, where we have videos from many different uh, competitions. Um, this episode in particular is dedicated to... The marriage of Stephanie P.P. Powers to Kenneth Kramig. Steph, when we met you almost a decade ago, we had no idea what amazing friend and person you have become. You've gone from the teenager who took years off our lives with her scary vault crashes to an amazing young woman who gets stronger every time she falls. Ken, as you marry Stephanie, you are marrying an elite gym nerd. We hope you love her more than the number of wolf turns in an elite competition, fluff pieces in an NBC broadcast, and the number of skills named after Nellie Kim and the Cove Points. <laughs> we hope that you will always be the hurdle to her round off, the tap swing to her giants, and the power behind all of her vaults. Congratulations on your marriage. There is no other couple we would rather do life and watch gymnastics with. From Marty and Margie. You guys, that was so beautifully done. Congratulations, you guys. Let us begin with Gym Nerd School 101. So the plan is this is an educational series. The purpose of this is education. And we're going to explain the rules, skills, myths, jargon, important gym nerd history, all created from your questions and questions that have come up over and over throughout the years. And this will be a series that will go on hoping to educate and hoping to create more people who can educate the four-year fans by the time we get to Tokyo, if that happens. We are focusing on women's artistic gymnastics, specifically. Um, in the U.S., I just want to start with saying we have a lot of different levels of gymnastics. So we have many different comp competitions and organizations, and I want to narrow down what we're going to actually be talking about. So if you're from outside of the U.S., we have all these different clubs and organizations. So we have United States Amateur and Independent Gymnastics Club, U.S. AIGC. We have the AAU, Amateur Athletic Union. Uh, we have the YMCA. We have, of course, USA Gymnastics, who is authorized by the International Gymnastics Federation to send athletes to world championships and Olympics. We also have school and college associations. So we have the NCAA. We have the NEIGC, which is intercollegiate competition uh, for clubs and adult gymnastics. We have public schools, high school championships, all of those. I'm mentioning all of those because those all have their own code um, and that are not necessarily the elite code of points, which comes from the FIG. So they have stuff like the Junior Olympic Code that used to be called the JO Code. It's That was called ACE, but then that was like a bad name because it has something to do with an abuse assessment test. So they now changed it to USAG Development Program. And all those are the levels below elite, and they use their own code, and it's separate than the elite code. So what we're going to be talking about now is um, the elite competition in the United States, which means this is when you can compete, be selected by your country to compete international in FIG competitions, what also called FIG, 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 or the Gymnastique Internationale, something in French, they also call it. So That's the official name. That something is, in French is part of the name of the FIG. Yes. Um, Federation Internationale de Gymnastique, I believe. Um, who used to be housed in a tiny Swiss-looking house in Switzerland, in Luzon, I believe. But now they are in a fancy business building because they're very fancy big time now. So um, let's look first at what it takes in the United States specifically to qualify as an elite gymnast. By looking at, let's watch Simone's um, qualifying beam routine, Simone Biles, while, while Spencer Simone. tells us. 
qualifying elite having to do the first thing that every elite potential elite qualifier has to do which is reach a minimum compulsory score through compulsory routines which still exist kind of slightly in the united states even though they were eliminated from international competition following the 1996 olympics uh you still have to do that first and get a minimum score with this beam routine that simone hated and finally got through her elite compulsory qualifying score so that she could become the best gymnast of all time uh and then you have to go to an elite qualifying optional meet uh there are specific meets for that you can also if you are very special and in the cool kids club you can get invited to a national team training camp and get your score there uh but you have to get a minimum qualifying score to be allowed to compete at the U.S. Classic and then a slightly higher score to be allowed to compete at the U.S. National Championships, which is how they limit the number of people competing at those. Those optional scores to get to Classic and Nationals, you have to get every single year. So every year you have to re-qualify unless you were on the World Championships team, then you get a pass. The compulsories, you just have to do once. So you did that once when you were like 12 and then you retire and you decide to come back to gymnastics at 36 you don't have to do the compulsories again that is set for life you got your score uh the optional score you have to get you have to re-qualify every single year and uh thank you to the borman family for that uh video if you're a club gym nerd member you can um watch along with us or of course we'll put this on our youtube channel so if you're just listening to this at home um so let's now talk about um since we got that out of the way because it's super boring and at, as you can see like <laughs> simone has never wobbled so many times on a beat routine in her entire <laughs> life there's just a She's lot of like I think kicks are stupid. Oh my god. There's a <laughs> lot of just that's kicking in relevé. That's the subtitle of the US Elite Compulsory Beam Routine. I think kicks are stupid. Why are there so many of them? You can see why this is they're still difficult. Like because you have to just do a bunch of stuff in relevé. That's basically jump in relevé, kick in relevé. It's just a relevé exercise. Relevé stills matters is what I'm trying to say. Um so let's look at the code of points and talk about um, what I just want to um, talk about kind of where it started, what it is specifically when we talk about the code. So mm -hmm. it used to be this um, binder that was in a green plastic folder, um, loose leaf, of course, so that you could add and remove pages. Cause you know, they changed the rules 170 million times, which you can follow the FIG help. What's it called? The Fig flask. The help desk, big, big plaque. plaque with a lot of clip art. So it's much 2020, clip art. and there's a lot of clip art. They do a lot to educate the public and the judges and the all the people, but we are specifically gearing this towards you guys, the fans. Now you can just download the code of points, um, and it's it's much more handy that way. I have to say, as a download, but I wanted to commemorate the green more handy color. than like just pieces of paper flying all over the place yeah it's more handy you don't have to go find it you could just always have it in your pocket which is what i like so it is a 209 page bible uh it has the rules for judging all the body shapes the deductions the composition for each event those requirements it also has what i want to talk about next in our first myth buster of this episode, <laughs> the attire requirements um, and the favorite subject and the penalties. So let us watch this routine by Marina Nekrasova, um, where she did a routine um, where she wanted to show as a Muslim that you do not have to wear a leotard to do gymnastics. Mythbuster number one, no leotards required in gymnastics. Um, you can wear a full unitard. She even has this around the bottom of her feet. Um, it doesn't just go to her ankles. And it is absolutely stunningly beautiful. You can also wear um, like a unitar a long sleeve shorts situation like a it's kind of like a singlet so we have elski from doha when she competed in 2015 um 2015 no that would have been 28 17 what year was that 2018 in doha she is competing with her like shorts outfit which are very elegant i really like because the design goes all the way down your hip so 
when people say, oh, my God, why is she wearing that? You can say, well, she doesn't have to. She could wear a unitard or a short situation. And it's very beautiful. Elongates the lines. I don't know why everyone doesn't uh, decide on this. But let me tell you why people don't always wear this. Because when you're doing skills like, say, a double front or a double pike, people... Um, tend to want to grab their legs and some people you'll see will completely this is one of the questions we got why do people put chalk all over themselves they'll put chalk behind their knees they'll put chalk between their thighs they'll put chalk like everywhere 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 so it's so that when you grab onto your body to make yourself in a tight ball so you can rotate faster so that your hands don't slip off and you will if you've watched gymnastics long enough see some horrible crashes where someone's hand slips off their knee and they come out of the rotation so they don't rotate as fast and they don't make it where they thought they were going to make it. Nekrasova does not have this problem because she is a master of the unitard and did a double front uh, or a double Arabian fantastically. No chalk on the naked legs needed. And some people like it for bars as well. So now that we are done, you guys can let everybody know you don't have to wear a leotard uh, competition attire rule 2.3.2. Quote it to people and then snap <laughs> Memorize when, it. <laughs> when you talk about this at parties next time. Did you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then we can discuss that. Okay. So let's talk about some of um, the sexy pages in the code of points, as I like to call them. <laughs> Do you? Yes. I. Okay. Everyone calls them the sexy pages, Spencer. Yeah, well I don't. Mm -hmm. it, it is well known. So um, the sexy pages, we have the shorthand. So when you see judges like write in that squiggly language, it's just mm -hmm. shorthand, like shorthand. And if you don't know what shorthand is, I think some people don't because it's like an old fashioned -y thing that we don't see anymore because people type now. Um, it was a way of taking notes and you could take notes really, really fast. And there are reporters who go to gymnastics competitions who know shorthand and still take notes in shorthand. So they write things down and you have no idea. It just looks like scribbledy gobbledygook on a piece of paper. And then they come up with all these amazing quotes in their stories. So that's what shorthand is. Um, commonly used in business and gymnastics has adapted it so that the judges can be as efficient well as efficient and fast as possible i mean mm, <laughs> could be done on an ipad uh something that actually captures everything they write but but you know for the, the days of paper they did a pretty good job <laughs> um it also has the eponymous skill section oh, so dear. <laughs> like many, just like skateboarding, when you do a skill for the first time in gymnastics, you get it named after you. Now, this is, has a controversial history, getting skills named after you. Um, it used to be that you could only get a skill named after you if it was done at a world uh, championships or an Olympic Games, and you had to be the first person to do it. Um, then, however... They let men and only men get skills named after them if they were the first person to perform the skill successfully. You can't just do it and like land in a heap. You have to actually land it successfully, grab the bar successfully. Um, only men were allowed to get things named after them at World Cups because the FIG was deeply invested in their sexism and wanted to keep that going. But um, they have now changed that in the last... Four years? Yeah. Three? Four years. So the year is 2020. When we're recording this, we're talking about uh, the 2020 code of points that will be used in the Tokyo Olympic Games at this point. And um, yeah, so, you know, because as Spencer says, women were just invented four years ago, they decided to allow them get things named after them at World Cups. And I would like to say that this podcast pointing that out over and over and over probably had something to do with that rule changing. I'm giving yeah. us credit. I mean, okay. I'm just saying. I don't know, but I think. Um, so... Spencer, there are some controversial things about <laughs> the table of elements. Just um, literally everything about it. Uh, um, yeah. yeah, it has had an, shall we say, unofficial history in its, uh, incons maybe an inconsistent history in when skills get added, what skills get added, whether they know they were, then someone will revise it and they'll just like remove a ton of skills for no reason and add a bunch of others for no reason so it is quite an inaccurate document um, but it is still you know, helpful sometimes it is helpful as a basis it needs some amending yes for, in, in the interest of accuracy and also spelling because no one has bothered to ever go through and spell check it so like 
at least 20 names are spelled wrong in it. Lots of people are missing. Some people are attributed skills that they never did. Some people got on the wrong side of someone who was in charge of the code at a certain point and just had a bunch of got a bunch of their skills removed for no reason and replaced with skills that are named after Nelly Kim. <laughs> you will often so Nelly Kim. Let's talk about the legend of the code and Nelly Kim because yeah. we bring her mm -hmm. up very often. A Soviet Olympic champion. She's an amazing gymnast. Um, and second she person to ever receive a ten at the Olympics. That's right. It happened either three days or 30 seconds after Nadia, depending <laughs> on who you hear tell the story. Three days um, is accurate. 30 seconds is Nelly. <laughs> so, um, uh, she's an amazing gymnast. So amazing. And she became the women's uh, technical committee head at mm -hmm. the FIG. So the women's technical committee head is the person that oversees the code, the changes in the code, the rules of the code. It's the person if there's a controversy at an Olympic Games and someone wants the that's put in an inquiry or once there's a, you know, something that might, we'll talk about later, like the judges messed up. So the wrong person won, mm -hmm. uh, became the Olympic champion. Um, then that is, uh, the person that intervenes in these, these situations. So, um, Nellie Kim rose to this position and there are all these skills that were in, the code of points that have been named after people, people like Tim Daggett, you'll hear him bring up often how he used to have a skill in the code of points and then they took it out. I would like Tim Daggett bring this up 117 times <laughs> every single time I was on an NBC broadcast, if that happened to me. So um, yeah. So Spencer, um, what happened? What happened to these, uh, these skills? It's a mystery for the sands of time. They just suddenly disappeared. Um, some of them, a very few of them, it's like legitimate. Actually, they went back and saw, oh, actually, maybe this person wasn't the first person to do this skill or it's uh, it's unclear because a lot of the skills that were originated in the 1960s, we just don't have all the video to know, like, was this person really the first person to do it? Well, the qualification routines from the 1960 Olympics don't survive, so you can never at this point go back and verify that 100%. Um, others, still there. Others added. Nellie Kim added a bunch of skills for herself, some of which she did originate, some of which, like the double tuck on floor, she performed at the Olympics alongside in the same rotation as a number of her other teammates at the same competition, but she decided it should be named after herself and none of those other teammates. <laughs> and what happens now? How has this situation been remedied when two people, say like at the 2017 17 World Championships, do the same skill for the very first time? Yeah, so until the last couple of years, if multiple people did the same skill at the same event for the first time, it was named after none of them. Uh, the rules have been changed so that can be named after both of them or all three of them with a hyphen should it come up. So it, at the 2017 World Championships, Nina Derwell of Belgium and Georgia May Fenton of Great Britain both got the Stalder Tkachev with a half turn named after themselves on bars. Uh, whereas uh, two years before, Sophie Shader of Germany and Kelly Sim of Great Britain both originated the same skill. Uh, the in bar to catch of piked and it's officially named after none of the, neither of them uh because that role was not in place yet but we as gym nerds will call it the shader sim or the shim if you'd like the shim. Uh, because it should have been named after them and it was just a stupid rule that it wasn't and they should get credit for originating that skill so celebrity couple names are a thing in gymnastics and we're here for that that's the way it always should have been um, so yeah, we should actually, uh, eventually come up with the actual name for a double back. It should be like the Kim, everyone I think else. That on one's team. tough because they were the first people to do it at the Olympics, but like but it had they, for sure they, been done before it had been for sure been done before. So that's the kind of one where I'm fine with that. We're just, that's a double back. That's yeah. a double tuck. It doesn't need to be given to anyone. Um, you know, it's just, it's a double tuck. Lots of people did it. And I feel like the first person that did it probably did it on grass at some ancient, you know, yeah. world championships. Yeah. Um, because people can't do double backs on grass because humans are amazing. Okay. So let's talk about the scores in gymnastics because this mm -hmm. has, um, we need to talk a little bit about the Olympics and, 
you know, if you're watching <clears throat> TV with someone and they're like, what's with these scores? What happened to the 10? Well, well there used to be a 10. How long do you have? <laughs> It used to be a 10. Um, and regardless of how difficult the routine was, and we had that for a very long time and gymnastics resisted changing because the 10 is our thing. You're a perfect 10. You're Nadia. Oh, it's so <laughs> iconic. That's why NCAA gymnastics on the women's side has not given it up. Um, but of course, it leads to a lot of problems. And then in 2002, we had the figure skating scandal um, where the judges were or a judge was bribed and there was a bunch of problems and they changed their system. And then in 2004, um, the all around final, this is very important for gymnastics. So 2004 men's all around Olympic final, there's a major controversy. Um, the eventual all around champion became American Paul Hom. Um, <clears throat> Yang Tae Young would have become the first South Korean um, all around Olympic champion by 0 0.051 uh, if he was judged correctly. But he was on P bars. In prelims, he got the right start value. All of his skills were, cr were credited correctly. Um, then in the all around final, three judges did not give him the right start value. So his score was lower. Uh, and that's where the controversy comes in. Um, he was only given a 9-9 nine, nine instead of a 10, even though he did the same skills exactly the same way that he did in prelims. So the judges made the mistake, but Yang's coaches didn't submit the inquiry on time. So technically, you're supposed to submit your inquiry before you go to the next rotation. That's why you see so many gymnasts. Uh, right as soon as they're done with their routines, famously, the Netherlands women do this because they have so many variations of their routines and they change it up as they go, at depending on Sano, what they make. Sano always does it. At least. Sano always does it. If Yeah. So um, if you have variations in your routine, but um, he did this exact same routine. He always does. There were no variations. So um, he didn't get the right start value. And instead of submitting an inquiry immediately before they rotated to their next event, and sometimes you don't get your score before, you know, it's right then when it's like, ding, and you're going, you don't know the start value got. He didn't submit the inquiry on time. So they didn't change his score. And that's the rules. That's the rules. They say they submitted him the right after the competition when one of the judges told them that they got the, or right before the, the medal ceremony, um, the FIG contention was that they only, they got the score like a couple hours after um, the final was over. So this ended up going to, so then Paul Hum ended up winning and um, Yang ended up third, even though, because he wasn't given the right start value, not because he didn't actually do the gymnastics that should have won because of a judging error, he placed third. So this ended up going to the um, sport of arbitration, the court of arbitration for sport. Um, and in the meantime, Bruno Grandi, who you'll hear us talking about a lot. Bruno Grandi is the former uh, president of the uh, gymnastics at the FIG. He's an Italian guy, loves men gymnastics. Would only talk about men's gymnastics. Did he know about women's gymnastics? I don't know. But he had a lot to say about men's gymnastics. Every example he was he would give was about men. Um, so he had said, the true winner of the all-around competition is Yang Tae Young and wrote a letter to Paul Hom saying that Paul should uh, acknowledge that and made a gesture that Paul should take his, in a press conference that Paul should <clears throat> take the medal off, give it to um, Yang. So the uh, Court of Arbitration of Sport stood by the FIG rules, which say you have to make an inquiry before you rotate for the end of the competition. And so Paul Hom remained the all-around winner. Um, and the three judges who made the state mistake were suspended. Um, so by the technical rules, Paul Hom remained the winner. By actual gymnastics, Yang should have been the winner. Um, and this hurt both of them greatly. And so because of these two big controversies, the figure skating, which had a 10 system ish and gymnastics, that was like, pff, blow it up. We finally have to make a change. This is too much. It only took this horrible thing happening for us to actually do something. And so then came the year uh, 2000. Was this the year 2000? 2006. 2006 is when we, the first year of competition under the open. I don't know why point. I said 2000, 2006. Okay. 
Um, yeah, 2006, we started an open-ended code of points where there was no cap on the score you could achieve and that scores were evaluated based on a difficulty score added to an execution score, which was still evaluated out of 10. And to get the total score, uh, it has gone through some adjustments since then since when it debuted in 2006 for the women uh on the event on bars beam and floor they were required to count their 10 most difficult skills it's now their eight most difficult skills um which lowered all of the scores because they're counting fewer scores um but that's kind of where we stand right now there have been slight adjustments each quad but that is the system a difficulty score and an execution score added together to get your total score is it less controversial than the Tano system? Nope. <laughs> Are mistakes still made? Yep. Yep. We just can't. It's just harder <laughs> to tell. <laughs> That's right, because there's more numbers. Um, also, one of the things that you'll hear us refer to a lot and gymnastics fans in general is the fact that Bruno Grandi sold this to the public by saying that we weren't getting rid of the 10. A 10 is still possible. The execution score is out of a 10, so someone could, in theory because no way in reality is this ever happening because we have seen perfect gymnastics performed and people have never gotten a 10 again um that you could still get a 10 in your execution score not the total but in your execution score um the other thing that he told us that was going to happen is we would now have the opportunity to have world records so you could have the highest ever score recorded on high bar the highest ever vault score which is the most likely um because vault scores score higher than all the other events so the problem with this of course is the code changes constantly and then every four years there's the big change so you could have world records but it's going to be per quad not overall because the mm -hmm. rules are not comparable were much higher in 2006 to 2008 for the women when they were counting more skills exactly um so we also had a question related to the code do you know why pike skills and tuck skills are usually worth the same Oof. i mean this is preach into the choir question um because tuck skills are overall in general overwhelmingly considered easier than pike skills if you're tucking your legs pike skill you have to keep them straight which is harder to do uh so if you're doing a double tuck on floor versus doing a double pike one would consider a double pike harder now at the elite level uh at the top when you get the top athletes they are very comfortable doing both a double tuck and a double pike and will be like snooze snore whatever i can do both of these things um but you know theoretically the tuck should be valued lower than the the double tuck should be valued lower than the double pike that ha argument has been floated many times basically every time there's a co a revision of the code the idea that instead of both elements being devalued that the tuck should be the double tuck should be a c and the double pike should be a d um and that is justifiable based on the difficulty of the skills. One of the reasons that they don't do it is a hope for a more diverse composition of routines. Uh, if you have value the double tuck as a C and double pike as a D, just everyone's going to do the double pike because they'll get more value for it. And then you have fewer variation of shapes. Now, I would argue that having a double tuck and a double pike in a routine is not that much diversity of element to begin with, but that is one of the reasons um, that we will see in the code of points. Often, you know, for the most part, the attempt is that their skills are valued based on their difficulty and that easier skills are valued lower and more difficult skills are valued higher. That's how it should be. Sometimes we will see skills valued differently for the sake of the powers that be in the women's technical committee don't want to have to see it anymore because they find it ugly. <laughs> so they're going to downgrade it. Like that is a legitimate. No, they're know, sick of it because everyone's doing it. They're, they're like, nope. It everyone's it, doing it the value ends up it. being not really based on a logical progression of skills or anything that makes sense but just someone who has authority doesn't like that element too and much so decided to downgrade it which happens all the time and this is why we drink <laughs> so let us discuss and watch um when we thought we were done with the 10 in 2006 <laughs> and we went to the world championships and we had the very first um the very all first around open -ended code. the first open-ended code and let's watch this routine from uh, vanessa ferrari who would eventually become 
the all around world champion, women's gymnastics first one from Italy. Amazing gymnast still competing to this day. Um, she has a brand new Achilles to help her out. And she does her first acro pass where she does a pack back handspring to a full and she falls off the beam. At the time that this happened, this was only a 0.8 deduction. And everyone was like, this is outrageous because the, if a fall used to only be half a point and it was, that was it. If you fell, you could never win anything. But now it's 0.8. I mean, that that's... In an open-ended code. In an open-ended code. scores are much higher. Right. They were like 0.8. Oh, it's a huge deduction. No one will ever win. And then came along Vanessa Ferrari and her beam routine and her giant D. So, and when we say giant D, we mean her giant difficulty score. And that 0.8 fall did not matter. And she became, uh, was it the first ever all-around champion with a fall? I believe in women? So, yes. Yeah, yes. I think so too. Um, and so because of Ferrari's greatness and how genius she and her coach were at putting together her routines that had such a giant difficulty value that she could fall and it wouldn't matter, um, gymnastics decided, oh, we should probably make that deduction a little higher. And so now the deduction for falling is one point. Two times, um, a whole two times higher. Yes, a whole two tenths higher. And now it also doesn't matter because Simone was born. So um, we have calculated yeah. in the past that Simone could fall in competitions. She and up to three times, I think, is the most falls we've gotten to and she could still win. So uh, that is uh, that is the legacy that we got that is, from Vanessa Ferrari. That is also the difference between... Uh, I would say generations of gymnastics fans, those who are horrified by the notion of someone winning an all around competition with a fall, because that will used to be like, oh, well, you fell, so you're out, um, versus those who grew up with this and are just like, well, yeah, you can win with a fall. Why is this a big deal? Yeah, you have the most difficulty. You're, you've all, you know, all the gymnastics you've watched has always been this way. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about the judges and uh, my favorite subject. Oh my gosh. So I need to talk about what a brevet is. We've had this question. What is a brevet? What do you guys talk about brevets? So let's watch this video um, from USA Gymnastics. Of a brevet. Of a brevet judge at work. So this is Michaela Maroney. Very professional. Favorite, uh, famous vault um, at the Olympic team finals in London. Um, and there is a, a judge named Cheryl Hamilton, who you famously see a brevet judge who freaks <laughs> whose mouth drops open as it should no matter how long mm -hmm. you have been judging when mm -hmm. you see or been a gymnastics fan or been alive when you see Maroni's vault you your mouth will drop open it's just a natural thing so um a brevet is the highest level of judge so um you can start as judging a level fives, level fours, whatever, and then you go on to the highest level and you become a brevet. That means that you can co you can judge the Olympics, worlds um, at the U.S. Olympic trials at U.S. Elite Championships. Um, and in the United States, there is a manufactured shortage of brevet judges, and we talk about this a lot because um, there are so many conflicts of interest in judging. There are college coaches who recruit gymnasts who they judge. There are coaches who are brevet judges who coach are their who, athletes they currently coach and giving them the scores that might determine whether they make a team. Right. Um, previously, it was allowed to have a family member judge you. So um, if you uh, you know, your daughter is competing, you could judge her. Um, but that is now not allowed by the FIG. Um, so, but this is an ongoing issue and they could just have more judges, but the USA Gymnastics only allows a certain number of people to test per, per, for brevet. And if you are a, I don't know if that's a national team member or a world or Olympic team member, I think world or Olympic team member, member you can skip all that level five Excel, all the years that everyone else has to do the normals. You can be invited. You, you can be invited to take the test and qualify as a brevet judge without doing any of that stuff um so you can be judging brevet without ever having judged before you still have to pass the test of course but without the experience of someone else so we don't like this 
because um, there could be more judges available to avoid these conflicts of interest. But uh, USA Gymnastics, up until this point, um, in December 2020, has decided they're not, as of now, not inviting more people. So there's still a shortage of purveys and conflicts still exist. Um, there's two panels of judges. You have the difficulty panel, the execution panel. Execution, just your, your toes weren't pointed, deduct. Your knees are bent, deduct. Your hips weren't flat. So that was not actually a layout. That was a pike. Um, they they take all the deductions. Well, the, well, the pike would be, would be D. That would be a difficulty judge awarding the value that is of correct. the skill. But the would, execution judges should also be deducting for yes. not ideal position. And this is an important thing to, to talk about. So let's say you're doing a Nabieva on bars. So that is sure. a laid out to Katya. So imagine you're swinging around the bar and giants, you let go. You basically just stand up straight and go all the way over the bar in a standing position. Like you're just waiting for the bus and then you grab the, the bar again. So if you, if your hips are bent, you can, you're supposed to be totally straight. If your hips are mm -hmm. bent, you can still get credit as long as they're not too bent. If they're too bent, then your skill becomes a church mm -hmm. and not an abieva. If they're just a little bit bent at the hips, then you're just going to get a deduction. But the, so you get the E, will, e panel gives you a deduction. The D panel will still give you credit for the nabieva. If you are too piked, then the D uh, panel is going to downgrade you to a church. Um, value is different, and that can affect your start value. And then the E panel might be like, no deductions. That was a perfect pike. Um, <laughs> and we should say, at an event like the World Championships, there will be different judges doing the D panel and the E panel. They'll be separate, but at other meets, domestic meets, they don't necessarily uh, have separate judges doing D and E. So sometimes judges will have to do both the difficulty and the execution at the same time. Um, there's always a head judge who's in charge of regulating everybody. There's also the way that the judging works is if there's people are out of range, then um, their score uh, is flagged for being not a great score. Um, the problem with out of range is um what if everyone else is wrong and you're out of range because you're right or you're sitting in an angle where you could see things differently because the judges aren't like all at the same angle stacked in a row on top of each other they are they spread be. that would be great that would be perfect sitting on each other's shoulders in a trench coat would be ideal but... <laughs> they're sitting at the table all spread out about 15 feet from the first judge to the last judge it right? really depends on how things are set up in the particular competition. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like at Worlds in general, when they have the ideal setup, you know, and they have these little like black dividers. Again, this is like at a World Championships Olympics, not necessarily at the, you know, the rest of the competitions in the world, like a World Cup, they'll just be sitting at a table all together right next to each other. Um, <laughs> they'll be in such a bad position. They have to get up and stand up to watch the routine and then go back to their table because everything's going great. Everything's fine. Also, it's not problematic to, you know, if you're sitting right next to the podium to be looking straight up into the lights, that's perfectly mm -hmm. fine. They never blind you. Positions and don't Everything. have any problems. So I do like that they have now in the ideal situations moved the judges off the floor onto a higher. So their level in general, their level are a tiny bit higher than the podium when they judge. That has been an improvement. Um, we do have to talk about robot judging. I know you would love to. Oh my God, it's my favorite topic. So um, robot judging, how it works. So this is how it works. Fujitsu, which is like a computer company. Which is um, a computer. It's like computers and stuff. Uh, they're like, you know, I am just speculating because of my own speculation about how I would do this if I was Fujitsu. Um, I would be like, wow, you know, the future is really robots and we have robots who can like do dangerous jobs and make stuff. But what we really want is like, who are the most athletic, amazing people in the entire world? Duh, gymnasts. So if we had a robot that could mimic a gymnast, it could do anything. It would be a totally unstoppable robot that could do anything from warfare to like nursing home work to fix a car um, or deliver your groceries, make a pizza. So they were like, Hey, let's pay the international gymnastics federation a lot of money so that we can, um, develop a judging system. I'm using air quotes, um, 
which they did, where we can gather all this information and all these data points from gymnasts and how perfectly they move. Um, and we can evaluate by angles the difficulty score of, um, of these gymnasts. And the judges can use it as a, a way to have a judging system that is not biased. So no humans involved, no implicit bias. Um, there is just a robot judging these things. <clears throat> So um, right now, the way that this system works is that it is used only if there's a problem with judging. So if all the judges are way off when their scores, there's a discrepancy in range, then the score can go to the robot judge and the robot can evaluate the D score. Um, now, there's no actual robot standing there evaluating. It would be yeah. amazing if they did that. Oh, my God. Can we please have a robot judge and can I wear one of those little English wigs? That would be so cute. I would love that. Um, <clears throat> and have a little gavel. Um, but right now, <laughs> um, you barely know what's happening. And we only find out afterwards. And they're not making much of a to-do about it, which I'm very disturbed by because I would really like to see it. Um, and it can evaluate e-score, so the execution. It can deduct if your toes aren't pointed, if your knees are bent, um, if your arms are bent on your vault, on your takeoff. Um, but they're not using it for that yet. Um, why? Because I think the judges would revolt. But also, I think it's important because I think this needs way, way, way more testing until they do that. Um, one of the biggest problems with robot judging is that... Um, some, they asked the gymnasts to have their body scanned beforehand. Um, some gymnasts have opted in, some gymnasts have been, have opted out. Some gymnasts has wisely been advised by their federations or their lawyers or their agents or anyone who understands, um, uh, AI, um, that allowing your body to be scanned like that and allowing a company to use it. Um, on their own in perpetuity to make their robots and their software smarter is unfair to you as an athlete. Um, and so they have not been scanned. And basically the scanning is they just have the athletes stand in front of these sort of lasery cameras. They're not lasers, but anyway, and they just stand in different poses. And so they get an idea um, of the different body shapes and then they use it um, for so that the robots judges can get smarter. Um, so it is, as you might have gleaned from this, controversial for several reasons, but um, also exciting and interesting. This podcast is brought to you by TumbleTrack. TumbleTrack has a holiday sale guide to get the perfect gift for the gymnast in your life um, or conditioning person that loves to do conditioning at home in your life. People like to work out at home, you know, that's a thing. Um, I just got a TumbleTrack panel mat and I'm obsessed with it. Obi's obsessed with it. He likes to hide under it. He, we also now use it to block the door so that he can't get out. I have uh, been doing my like, warm ups and handstand uh, forward rolls and pirouettes, and he's very entertained by that too. So, um, Tumble Track, they're also having a laser beam competition with individual and team prizes. So, check that out. There's big prizes like buy a whole new piece of equipment. Check it out at tumbletrack.com. That's T U M B L T R A K.com. Thanks, Tumble Track. Hello, Fresh. Hello Fresh. You've heard of them. Just seeing the Hello Fresh. Hello Fresh. It's a meal kit delivery service. You know that we both use it. It's easy, stress-free. Um, they offer convenient no-contact delivery to your doorstep for easy home cooking for the whole family. It's flexible for your lifestyle. Like when we travel, we just change the order. So um, you can also have holiday meals delivered. Did you know about this? This is pretty awesome. And you can be like, oh, I have, you know, this many people coming. So they'll deliver that much. Um, or you can just be like, it's just the two of us. So we would like Thanksgiving for two, please. Or Thanksgiving for one, please. Um, also, I like that I know I'm eating something good when I get. That's like good for me when I get HelloFresh. It's delicious and nutritious. Uh, fresh, high quality pre-portioned ingredients so you can make meals that are good for you. My favorite recent one is the apricot balsamic glazed pork tenderloin with green beans. Have you had this one yet? I don't think so. <sighs> okay. I mean, I would not. This is not something I would not. Jessica shout the oh. green beans. So, oh, you know. green beans. So do you know how I feel about green beans? I mean, this is not something I would order off a menu, but it's freaking delicious. So again, 
my horizons have been widened with HelloFresh. If you guys want to try it, go to HelloFresh.com forward slash slash Gymcastic90 and use code Gymcastic90 to get $90 off, including free shipping. Go to HelloFresh.com forward slash Gymcastic90 and use code Gymcastic90 to get $90 off, including free shipping. This episode is sponsored by Native Deodorant. Jessica, the holiday season is right around the corner. Did you know? This is true. And we are getting into the spirit, even me, by indulging in the sights, sounds, and scents of the season. And one thing I made sure to do was update my Native collection with their candy cane holiday scent, which I am, in fact, keeping next to my desk and periodically throughout the day, uncapping it so I can smell peppermint. And it's just a better thing to do. It's improve it's improving my month. It's improving your life so many things. Smell fresh and sniff fresh whenever you yeah, need it. And my nose is very deodorized, if nothing else, <laughs> because I am just periodically being like, oh yeah, peppermint. <laughs> um, native deodorant has ingredients that you've heard of. The candy cane scent has peppermint oil and doesn't use ingredients that shouldn't be in deodorant, like aluminum or talc. The uh, there's also a candy cane gift set available, Jessica, which includes toothpaste for that special person in your life whose face needs to smell like peppermint which is everybody <laughs> i enjoy a peppermint flavored toothpaste who does that's how your breath breath should smell mm -hmm. i agree with this <laughs> Native is risk-free to try, and every product comes with free shipping within the U.S., plus 30-day free 30-day returns and exchanges. So you, too, dear listener, can give the gift of Native by going to nativedeo.com slash gymcastic. That's nativedeo.com slash gymcastic, or use the promo code gymcastic at checkout and get 20% off your first order. And make sure you order before December 7th to get your products in time for Christmas. That's nativedeo.com slash gymcastic, or use the promo code gymcastic. So you guys, we are running a contest. We are going to give away, gymcastic has a contest. We are going to give away merchandise anything you want from our store anything you want um and a three club gym nerd membership so three people are going to get whatever they want from our store plus a year membership to wow gymcastic i know i know we're big spenders you guys <laughs> so you don't you know basically what we want to know is why did you become a club gym nerd member and we want you to record something you don't have to use your or name why would anonymous. you become a club gym nerd or why member? would you like you are we're giving right. presumably you're not one because we're giving away a club member. well you can be a member if you're already a member oh, you could be a member and then get a free year yes exactly so you can already be a member so you don't have to use your name um it's just something we want that we could use on the show to explain to other people why they might want to join so some kind of recording so you can record a voice memo on your phone and just email it to us at gymcastic at gmail.com um, make sure it's not longer than 30 seconds it can be as short as you want it can be like 15 seconds if you want um so just let us know why you became a member or why you want to be why you would support gymcastic um points for creativity so song <laughs> poem haiku funny is always a plus you know we enjoy the giggle around here possible uh, rage meter <laughs> also always fine. A rage meter is always encouraged we love a rage meter we've got a couple in this episode i think <laughs> yes um so use hashtag club gym nerd and tag us gymcastic on instagram or twitter and then of course also send us at that email gymcastic at gmail.com um and make sure you send that voice memo and email us also what you want from the t public store so anything you want so go to gymcastic.com click on the store tab go in there look if you want a pillow if you want a tapestry if you want a mask if you want a sweatshirt a tapestry you guys that's literally something you can get a notebook whatever you want um go there put it your size the color and your name and address so we can send them off so you guys uh so you can start entering now and the deadline will be december 12th is the deadline so we make sure that we get things shipped off to you so good luck and thank you so shall we move on to talk about leaps one of to. we had so many questions about this because it's hard it is hard and i think that one of the hardest things about leaps 
is that um and evaluating leaps and telling who's doing what is that um we gymnastics comes from ballet the original code talked about ballet it is descended from ballet the code of points was made by a Euro bunch of europeans so of course they put the ballet in there <laughs> bunch, of <Europeans. laughs> bunch of europeans you know they're obsessed with the ballet so um they um we call things by their ballet names even though now it really look like the ballet <laughs> It's not even close to the ballet term. Someone would do it and you'll be like, if you know ballet, you're like, that's not a tergite. That wasn't yeah. a tergite. Don't call it a tergite. Take that tergite out of your mouth. <laughs> that was not a tergite. Um, tergite. That's what they have. They say it. Tergite. A forte. That was not a forte. <laughs> um that's the proper french mm -hmm. just so you know a releve <laughs> so <laughs> um so let's talk about how even in the process of putting this together i was like here's a gif of a switch half and spencer's like that's not a switch half and i was like obviously that's a switch half so um even experts like us <laughs> have debates on these things yep. so spencer let's talk about why and how we are decide how what our approach is to this and what's out there yeah, well one of the reasons we wanted to do this in general is that i felt like in the years when i was trying to watch gymnastics and identify what the different skills were which we have an assortment of animals for you to enjoy looking at the animal jumps while we talk about this if you're watching the video um wanting to learn like okay what i can't i'm watching these routines i can't tell i i've watched a d score video that says that's a switch leap full and that's a split leap one and a half or a tour full and i don't know how to tell the difference so let me do some youtube searches and look and see if someone's out there explaining like how do you tell the difference between these things and most of the things that are out there are specifically aimed for coaches like, this is an instruction video for coaches who are going to learn, teach an athlete how to do this skill with the progression and how what the technique is. And I'm like, no, 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 no. All while being super mean, because apparently that's part of it. The sport is really healthy. Like, <laughs> seriously, if you go search for, like, there's not a video where the coach isn't just acting like a jerk for no reason to these seven-year-olds who are supposed to be demonstrating, like, a tour jeté. And there's just being like, that's not right. Caitlin, Caitlin's going to get up and do it. And you're like, why are you so mean? Why is that part of it? So anyway, it's horrible, but also not helpful for fans who are like, okay, I'm literally, I'm never going to teach anyone this skill. I'm certainly never going to do any this skill. I just want to be able to look at it and know what I'm looking at and be able to identify what I'm looking at while I'm watching a routine. So that's what we wanted to do here. One of the weirdest parts of dance elements on beam and floor are dance elements named after animals there's no logic to this they make no sense there's no no prior knowledge you can bring to this like oh yes i'm quite experienced with wolves i know what they look like so i should certainly be able to identify a wolf jump nope doesn't look anything like it you just kind of have to see them a lot of times and learn that there are some leaps that are named after animals and they don't look anything like that and are not helpful at all so to describe them for you, a yeah. stag jump is a split, a stag leap, a stag jump, anything stag, a stag handstand is a split with the front leg bent. A ring is a split with the back leg bent, but it can't just be a bent. It has to be, it, your neck has to be back, but not just back. You can't be back like you smelled something bad. It has to be back <laughs> like you are reaching back for the love of your life, releasing the neck is what they say um and it has you have to make a little circle with your head release and your back leg that's a ring mm -hmm. a wolf i would say the stag which is the straight back leg and bent front leg in a split is the most believable for the animal yes like you could see you can see it you're like okay i see where we're going with stag a wolf jump where one leg is extended in a split and the other leg is also forward but tucked under the body. Or a pike um, jump with one leg bent. The only way you could possibly make the argument that this is a wolf is if you, maybe if you, the shape that you would make with your hands if you were doing a shadow puppet of a wolf is the shape the legs are making, maybe. But that's no. really all you could. It just doesn't look like a wolf, but... 
We used to call this a fish jump. You and used to call this fish jump. Is that better? A pi- yeah, because I think a pike jump with one leg bent, it looks more like a fish hook. Mm. So, but no one calls it that. I don't know. We just called it that in Seattle. I don't know why. Seattle, ocean <laughs> oh, Seattle. fish, <laughs> local <laughs> fisheries, and whatnot. Um, the sheep jump. Basically, a sheep jump is when you want to cause back fractures. You uh, basically, <laughs> it, it's a. Um, it is a you make a ring with your body by arching your back. So you arch your back and arms as far back as you can, and your head. Your head has to be released, and then you jump um, up in the air and bend your knees. That is a sheep jump. It, you can also think of it as a a bridge in the air, where you try to touch your head and your feet. Um, the the sheep jump is one of those things. Um, I agree with. Uh, famously, like Amy Borman says, she does not teach this at all or a ring position unless your body naturally does it without trying. It's not good for you because you have to keep your knees together and your pelvis wants your knees to go out when they're in that position. And so it's one of those things that if you don't use it right or you try to force it, it can really hurt you. So I'm not a fan. I also think it's always ugly. There's only like one person that's ever done it pretty. So I'm just like, which we have an example of in this video. Um, so Let's talk about the butterfly, or if Your it has favorite. a full a full twist in it, a tong fei, full twist in butterfly. Um, it's amazing. I feel like this came from like ice skating, figure skating, dance, and that's why mm. they call it the butterfly. Butterfly is when it looks like you're doing an aerial, but on a horizontal plane. Is that a good way to describe it? I like it. It's so fun. Everyone should do a butterfly. I'm still waiting for someone to do a butterfly on beam. This is my dream. Someone please make this come true. Maybe Max Whitlock can add that after he does air flares on Pommel Horse. Um, Max Whitlock and his beam capabilities? <laughs> yes. I'm sure, sure he could do it. Um, a cat leap. Oh, the most loathed. The most but, loathed. Uh, Easiest also, to fake. nothing like a cat. No. A cat, um, cats should not have leaps named after themselves because a cat leap is sitting there. <laughs> That's what a cat leap is. <laughs> Falling asleep on a top of a book. And you're like, how is that comfortable? That's a cat leap. So a cat leap is, should be in the O'Byrne Court of Points, which by the mm-hmm. way, doesn't exist. It's not a real thing. It's just my feelings about the gymnastics rules. Someone did ask, is that real? Like, what is the O'Byrne Code? And I was like, it's just made up by me and my feelings. <laughs> so these, this is the important of Gym Nerd School 101. We answer these important questions, everybody. Um, so a cat leap is um, a, you jump and switch legs mm-hmm. in front of you. You bring Alternate. both legs. Alternate. Alternating jumps. The knee should go above the hips on both times. It often doesn't, but it should. And if you're doing it beautifully the way it should be done, even though the code doesn't require this, you should be able to balance a small cup of coffee on your inner thigh. That is how you have the correct turnout. <laughs> the code doesn't require that, but if you want to really impress people, that is how you will do your cat leap. No one ever does it like that. There's like two people. So moving on. We're <laughs> one past of the, the questions we had was to differentiate between tour jeté variations and twisting switch leaps. So one of the most difficult things, and it seems you feel like you get it when you're first learning, because a switch leap, which we call it in the US, a change leg leap is what they call it in the UK, which is more helpful because yes. that's exactly what's happening. Um, you are switching legs to hit a split position in midair. So you're leading with one leg and then whipping that same leg that you led with back to get the momentum to hit a 180 degree split position. That and seems the, really, really And the FIG, so in, when... the, in the code, it, it says... Split leap forward with leg change, which it totally makes sense. Yes. And so you think, okay, got that versus a split leap where you are you bring one leg forward and you continue leading with that front leg. You bring the other leg back to hit a split position. Everything sounds great and straightforward. And then people start twisting and it gets kind of confusing. So we have a video here of Simone on beam doing her switch leap to switch leap half combination. So if you watch this here in the first one, the switch leap, her left leg goes forward, then it goes back. Got it. But this on the switch half, her right leg goes forward, but then 
it also ends up once she does her half twist that the right leg is her front leg. So you're kind of, if you're watching the legs for, for them to switch, they don't really appear to switch in a switchly path. So that's one of the more confusing things. So if you're watching these skills, you're looking at them, you're saying, how do I identify which one? We can go to the next slide. So on a switch leap, if you're trying to differentiate between like a switch leap with full turn or a split leap one and a half on floor and they kind of look the same because they're just jumping and splitting the switch leap you will notice will have a characteristic leg cross or scissoring position that's what how i have always identified them and you will see the gymnasts start to turn because they're trying to get that switch done as quickly as possible so they can get it done and land and get credit for it um, and that cross leg that we're looking at here is something you will only see when the athlete is doing a switch leap you won't see it when they're doing a split leap so if we go to slide 11 which is the next one you'll see simone initiating a split leap with the plant leg down the other leg flies up to initiate the split and then she'll go into in this case a split leap one and a half um and you don't have that same legs crossing. So if you are in real time looking, trying to differentiate, saying, how do I differentiate? The way I do it is to look for that leg cross in the switch version. If you see those legs form an X, then you know you're doing a switch because you won't see that in the split. So in the next slide, in slide number 12, we can watch them in real time. So this is Simone doing a switch leap, full turn. And this is Simone doing a split leap, one and a half turn. So if you watch those again and again and again, sometimes you will end up feeling like, okay, I can tell the difference between a switch and a split. At least that is how I do it. That was a very good way to look at it. I never thought of it like that before, but seeing the crossing, but it's helpful. That's why I wanted, that's like why I wanted to do this because I've had to come up with sort of my own fan. I never did these. I've never done a split leap before kind of way to uh, interpret them and oftentimes when gymnasts are describing it they'll be like oh you know how when you did this when you were learning gymnastics it's like that is not helpful to me now mm -hmm. so it's things like that where I'm like just watch for the cross leg thing that's what happens yep. the cross leg <laughs> thing right in the beginning yep now or one of the things that drives both of us crazy but mostly Jessica oh. is the terminology between describing split leaps. So we're not talking about switch leaps right now, split leaps as tour jetés or split leaps. The the fights there will be. The, the split. A tour jeté and a split leap are completely different things. We understand that they're totally different. In gymnastics terminology, they are used interchangeably. Uh, but When it comes to, a ha when there's a half turn added. Right, a tour jeté by definition includes a half turn. Yes, when you add an extra leap. So if you're describing a leap using tour jeté terminology and you say a tour jeté half, that is a split leap. There's a total turning of a full turn because yes. a tour jeté implies a half turn. If you're saying it's a tour jeté half, that's a full turn. So a tour jeté half and a split leap full, those terms refer to the same thing in yes. gymnastics. <laughs> And not in ballet. Right. In ballet, totally different. And a tergete is a fouette with a switch. Right. And... A tergete should really hit the 180 degree split position at an angle to the floor. Whereas in gymnastics, you will see split leaps hit 180 degrees parallel to the floor. And that's considered correct. That is what you're supposed to do. Um, but a ballet person would say, well, that's not a tergete because you're hitting split parallel to the floor. Um, in gymnastics, we're like, who's a ballet? The split's supposed to be parallel, so that's a tour jeté, a split leap. You know, I prefer the split leap terminology because I think it's more explicit. Uh, also, because if you say split leap full, there's a full twist rather than having to remember like, okay, a tour jeté has half in it already. So a tour jeté half has a full twist. I think it's also just more straightforward. I think the easy way to remember this is like, oh, no one does a tour jeté anymore. Some people do it on beam. So on beam, you might see just a tour jeté. So it's someone looks like they're taking off doing a jump with one leg in front of them then they half turn land in a beautiful arabesque after hitting a split at an angle that is a tergite you'll know it when you see it on beam because it'd be like oh, what was that stunningly beautiful artistic ballet moment what's that nobody does that in gymnastics anymore 
and then the hearts of a million gym nerds born before the year 2000 will flutter with joy. And then um, if you see a tergite half, a real one, which doesn't matter according to the code of, code of points. Code of points does not care. A tergite half would have the split occur at an angle. But it doesn't matter. Nobody cares. But just in your heart, <laughs> in you your will heart, care. That's be a half. In your heart, that's going to be a half. In your heart, your heart will flutter. I'll be like, oh, <laughs> that was different. And then uh, a tergite, uh, a split leap full, it will just look like a regular, even, horizontal split. Um, th this becomes very confusing, I think, for a lot of people because there is a deduction for the angle of your split on many leaps, but this is not one of them. So if you do a split leap and it's all wackadoodle and it's just a split leap and your you know, front leg is way higher than your back leg, that's a deduction. It's not an even split. But when, when it comes to the tergite half, which is equal to a split full, it does not matter. <sighs> a switch full, sorry. Um, <laughs> and it's so aggravating, you guys, and I totally understand. And this is why we have used a beautiful image of a... Fa is that a Boganskaya? You added this. I think it's it's from your site. Actually, I should mention. Oh, I don't remember. <laughs> so Spencer on the balancebeamsituation.com, he has a clickable code of points. So if you want to see the GIF of these, if you want to go and see like, what is a Van Leeuwen compared to a uh, Maloney? I can't remember this stuff. Clickable code of points at the balancebeamsituation.com with all these great GIFs. And you can see what a tergite is supposed to look like. I think it's Bogan Sky. It's definitely someone Soviet because of the beauty. You can tell. And um, the leotard. And the leotard. <laughs> Mostly the leotard. Um, so, ah, oh, it's just so pretty, you guys. I could look at it all day. Ah, oh, so anyway, gymnastics is wrong. End of story. Ballet is right. <laughs> now, let's get to the most... I So if you're watching the video, I'm going to try to do this next part. We're going to talk about bars. We're going to talk about the other question that we got the most, which is grip variations. I am yeah. going to try to show you with my arms and hands mm -hmm. as we do this, which should be entertaining. We also Good have day. GIFs and videos to show you to help you along with this. But this is really something I think it's for me. I mean, having done gymnastics, it's just like a feeling looking at something. Mm -hmm. Um and if you want to try to think about how these are, if you've ever done gymnastics, if you've ever done any of these grip variations, um, a lot of them, like you learn a giant out of a, um, a back extension roll, you can start learning, thinking of putting yourself in that back extension roll position. You hit your hands in and then um, the turn happens in some way of these grips. Or sometimes it's a, a cast um, that you get into these positions. But um it's so even for me, I'm just like, if it looks super painful, I'm like eagle grip, <laughs> L grip. Like that's yeah. what's happening. Um, um, very common. This may be getting, this may not be gym nerd school 101. This is like gym nerd school 301. PhD. I think this is, the, but we, you know, we'll throw things in. Just don't worry if you don't get it. We'll review before the final. <laughs> um, <laughs> we should create quizzes for this. That's a great idea. Maybe a listener can create a quiz. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of people asking to explain the difference between an, an Ono and a Ling and a Healy, which are more commonly known as those one-armed E-rated pirouettes that the Chinese gymnasts and Nastia do. <laughs> um, and, you know, first of all, if you just want to call them those E-pirouettes, we all talked about it. We're all fine with it. We're like, fine, we're, yeah. It's, it's totally fine. Like, you can still consider yourself an expert gym nerd if you're like... I'm just not going to learn the difference between these. They're just the E pirouettes. I know they're hard. I know they're really beautiful when done correctly. And that's, that's what I, I know. Need to know. It would, I know it hurts. Fun. It's good. Um, yeah. And we had another person ask about the millions of grips on bars saying I've been watching since 1996 and I still can't tell them apart. I want to know how to differentiate between reverse grip and L grip skills in videos of routines. Do you have any tips for what to pay attention to? Usually it can be hard to see the palms of the gymnast's hands or their elbow positions. I completely agree. When I was trying to learn those E pirouettes, the thing that I had read about it was to watch the elbows, which is theoretically true, but I'm like, this just look they're all sticks all of their arms are sticks in a long sleeve leotard i cannot tell the difference between where an elbow is none of them even have elbows this is just 
sticks. Um, so that was not helpful to me. Um, so I under I completely understand where this person asking the question is coming from. So to get into those pirouettes, I think we need to start by talking about the different types of grips. And Jessica, so this is where Jessica is going to uh, demonstrate. Okay, so you talk us. and I will demonstrate. Okay. So the first grip, the most straightforward, regular, normal grip, you just grab the bar. In front of you, you're grabbing the bar. That's, we got it. Yeah. Some That's people... not helpful what Jessica is doing because you can't straight. <laughs> That's not you're... grabbing the bar. You're going to slip off in All right. one second. <laughs> I'm going this way. Okay. So you grab the bar. One thing is um, you swing with your thumb around the bar. And then um, some people, you're, you're sorry, you don't swing your thumb around the bar. You swing with your thumb next to your finger like this. But when you get into handstand, some people switch and grip the bar. So this is women's gymnastics we're talking about. Grip it all the way around um, to hold their handstand positions. Little trick. If you see that people hold their handstand positions for a really long time, some of them switch and then put their, um, their thumb around. Um, so that's just regular old hanging onto the bar position. And then we have reverse grip, also pretty self-explanatory and straightforward. It's just grabbing it from behind. Mm -hmm. Then we get into L grip, also called eagle grip. You will hear those interchangeably. They refer to the same thing. That is if, <laughs> like, so in, that's, yeah. Put your hands out of the frame and then you'll so, know what eagle grip is. So um, put your hands over your head, turn your elbows out. I don't even do it. So, I, so <laughs> imagine you're doing, you know, you have hands forward, front grip, and instead of bringing them in to grab the bar like you would reverse grip, like turning them in or supinating them to use the supinating, term, you would pronate and push the turn them all the way out and grab the bar around this way. This is why, this is another thing where I feel like if you can't just do this with your arms, you shouldn't. No one should try to make you do it. This is why we talk about because like people's arms don't even do that. Like try. So stand basically or do this. So stand flat against a wall. Put your arms over your head. Now try to turn your arms outward, not inward, outward and touch the wall flat behind you. That's yeah. that's the grip we're talking about. Yeah. Um, and theoretically, humans can do that. Once you turn it around, it's supposed to look like an eagle's talon, <laughs> like that, maybe like that. Um, yeah, so that's anyway, that's why it's called eagle grip, another animal we didn't get to. Um, but uh, I I typically say L grip, but I also like saying eagle grip because it sounds cooler. So, but anyway, they, they are the, to the same, same thing. thing. This is the other thing, like, um, a like a switch full and a tergite half. Split full. Split full. Split full. Sorry. <laughs> Split full, tergite half, eagle, and L grip are the same they thing. They are the same thing. Um, you will also hear mixed grip refer to. So specifically, typically we'll say that talking about, for instance, uh, Tkachev with half turn. So if an athlete is doing a Tkachev and they're turning halfway, doing a half turn to grab it like in a Tweddle or a Durwell Fenton, uh, they'll catch it in a mixed grip. And so, one so hand forward, if you're one Jessica, hand under. you don't like calling it a Tkachev half because they're not actually doing a Tkachev half. They're just doing a Tkachev and catching in mixed grip instead of regular grip. And the turn kind of happens after you grab the bar and the grip sort of wrenches your body in the right direction. These are facts. Some people actually do a half turn. So I am going to wait for those people and not call it a half because catching it. So catching a mixed grip is just one hand is forward. One hand is under basically. So if you want to try this in the playground um, or you're on your pull-up bar, you know, if you jump Don't. on, if it's safe, <laughs> if you jump and catch one hand forward, one hand under, your body will naturally turn as you swing. So that's the way to think about mixed grip. Um, so that's yeah. the first kind of the first thing you need to know if you're differentiating between these e pirouettes because the difference between them is the grip that they start in versus the grip that they finish in. So there are three options, and that's helpful because there are only three, and you can kind of keep track of them that way. There's an ono, which begins in L grip and finishes in reverse grip. There's a Healy, which begins in reverse grip and finishes in L grip, so it's the opposite. And then there is a Ling, which begins in L grip, immediately switches to reverse grip, 
and then does the full rotation to finish an L grip. So it becomes after the it, 90% of the time, it's the same thing as a Healy. Uh, but at the first, it first you have to switch to reverse grip and then you do a Healy. Uh, these can be very difficult to identify in real time. Uh, so I don't try to identify them based on the skill that I'm looking at, because especially if you're watching on video, sometimes the the camera angle or the quality of the stream, you're literally not going to be able to tell. Like you're not going to be able to see the information clearly enough to tell the difference. So what I do is follow the grip, like knowing what grip we've gotten into can tell you what pirouette you're seeing. Uh, even if you're like, I can't tell what her elbows are doing, or even her hands just look like a blur on the screen. I can't see what they're doing. But if you follow the grip, then you can kind of tell which one is which based on the logic of what you must be performing from that grip. So what helps is knowing, knowing, being able to identify the difference between a blind change and a Higgins roll, I think is the key to being able to identify those E pirouettes. So a blind change and a Higgins are both variations on a giant swing with a half turn. A blind change gets you into reverse grip and a Higgins roll gets you into L grip. So we can look at them here. The blind change, you see Alyssa Bauman on the left turning in to get to reverse grip. On the right, you see Nora Flatley turning out to get herself into L grip and doing a Higgins. So the if you watch those enough, you can kind of see, okay, one's turning in and one's turning out. You see Nora do a full, you know, giant swing up to handstand and then initiate that half turn as she's turning out to get herself into L grip. Alyssa's sort of initiating it early and turning in as most people do when they're doing a blind change. So one is into reverse grip, one is into L grip. So then... And then one thing yeah. I want to say about these two. So the way that I identify these, if you want to call them out is, um, and it's very scientific, you guys, it is that um, reverse grip. If someone's doing a blind change then I'm like, Oh, are they going to do um, a Jaeger or a double front out of this? Like this is the, how I identify like what's coming next. And then um, the L grip, the Higgins roll, um, I just identify as ouch. When you see it, it's a <laughs> roll it, through ouch. Like, oh, yeah. Roll two shoulders aren't supposed to do that. That's how you can, if you're like, what is it? The then, you know, it's, it was a Higgins roll that got there. <laughs> so you, if you see that Higgins roll, which is on the right, um, you now know that we're in L grip. So if we're going into an E pirouette afterward, you've eliminated the Healy from possibility because we're not in the right grip to do that. The next skill is not going to be a Healy. It's either going to be an Ono or a Ling. And if we go to the next slide, the way to identify the Ono, which Nastia Lucan would do, is this characteristic arm flourish as she goes around the body. You'll see that big arm swing. You only see that in an Ono. You don't see that in a Healy or a Ling as you go out and around. And I find that to be the easiest way to identify them. The unhelpful thing about that is that no one really does Onos anymore. They were popular for a second. We see very few of them now. It's sort of like, like much like the Twilight series, they went out of style in 2008, but people still <laughs> talk about them for some reason. Um, so that's the Ono, whereas a Ling will not have that arm flourish. Whereas if you've seen the blind change, um, you know that the E pirouette that follows it has to be a Healy because a Healy is the only one that starts from reverse grip. And then if you had a Healy, you've started from reverse grip, you know now we're ending that Healy in L grip. So the next one, if there's another one, has to be either an Ono or a Ling. And you kind of go back to that. We can watch Tang Shi Jing here. Starting with a blind change. We'll watch this a couple times. So she's in reverse grip. So you know she has to be doing a Healy, which ends in eagle grip or L grip. So now we know she's either doing an Ono or a Ling. This one, she's turning in. It's not that big arm flourish. So it's a Ling, which also ends in eagle grip. So again, we see the blind change turning in here. And then into the next pirouette has to be a Healy. Ends in eagle grip and then goes into her Ling. And if you are looking closely, you can see her one hand does do that initial hop little grip change to get into reverse grip to make it look like a Healy. Um, it's really hard to see that in real time often. So I don't look for it, but this angle actually gives a pretty good view of her left hand right here, switching grip there and then doing a pirouette. 
um, which is also characteristic of the Ling. So, Jessica, anything to add to that? Or have I just confused everyone and made everything very unhelpful? No, I think this is actually incredibly helpful. And I think it's one of those things that it's really, it is really hard to describe on a podcast. And that's why we're making the, the video yeah, available. Yeah, I would encourage you to watch this part because it's really like using words is difficult. And it's I'm really referring hard. to the video because um, you kind of need a visual aid to understand what you're seeing. <laughs> Yeah, and normally the video is reserved for our Club Gym Nerd members, um, but this is occasionally we make our uh, the video of the podcast public, and this is one of those cases because um, it is so hard to talk about, especially like grips and give these instructions without uh, visuals. So for these special Club Gym Nerd, uh, sorry, Gym Nerd School series mm. for educational purposes <laughs> um we will be uh making these public and that reminds me to thank all of our club gym nerd members who have brought you guys if you're not a member this educational material this is sponsored by them our club gym nerd members help us pay for this podcast and all the costs that go into it including some of the videos that we're using here traveling to these competitions getting beautiful uh footage uh, shot by Deanna Hong and um, creating these amazing educational tools for fans, not for the coaches, not for the judges, <laughs> for the fans, the people who really matter. Thanks to all the club gym members. Okay. Now can we talk about um, the, the fun part? We did. Fun we part. finished the nerdy part. We finished. We ate our vegetables and now we get to have dessert. Is that yes. what we get to do now? So a lot of people have asked about kind of the jargon and the inside jokes that we make <laughs> as yeah. a community who lives on the gym internet and as listeners of Gymcastic and as gym nerds, gymnastics fans in general. And, you know, things happen, the being Galliavid, um, that's not in this episode. We'll do another one on it. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but what do those things mean? People are like, why is it funny when you yell, it was Adele Chev at someone? I don't understand. What is that a <laughs> reference to? So we are here to answer your question. So again, if you have a uh, questions that you want us to add to subsequent and future episodes in this series, please send them to gymcastic at gmail.com and put uh, gym nerd school in the subject line so we can make sure to save those for our next episode. But here are some of the ones that we got that people had the most questions about. And let's start with Carol. <laughs> who the F is Carol Spencer? And who is she? Mm. What happened? What is this legend of Carol? Carol began as a real person a real judge named Carol, who was just really go putting some really enthusiastic and creative scores out there at a University of Florida gymnastics meet at a certain point. Um, and by and enthusiastic, on, we mean forgetting to take deductions. Forgetting to take deductions, because she was just so happy and so in love with life and loving all the gymnasts, and everyone deserves a 10 because they tried. Um, and then Carol sort of took on a life of her own. Uh, and is just sort of a general reference to any judge who is particularly in college, not necessarily, um, judging to the point of not, in that you're not even taking deductions anymore, <laughs> and all of your scores are too high, and it is being a Carol. Imagine it like the slang term Karen, but for gymnastics. That's basically what it is. And not having to do with racism, just having to do with judging, judging. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, I feel like it's also there's a lot of Carol backlash. People are done with the expression, overused, understood. Um, but it is very helpful because so helpful. then you can talk about judges who might listen to a podcast and then they don't know that you're being really mean to them and they'll <laughs> still listen. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> That is the reason I find Carol helpful. <laughs> so that's the legend of Carol. So feel free to use it now freely. Oh my As God. Needed. Carol's judging tonight. Mm -hmm. Carol's on beam. Also, there are like five NCAA judges named Carol. Yes. Like you'll get <laughs> yeah. a meet where just like all the judges are named Carol. So it's not a specific Carol anymore. It's just anymore. anyone. <laughs> it did used to be. <laughs> it did start with a specific Carol, but no more. So let's move on to it was a Delchev. Nastia screamed. So the year was 2013. Wow. It was May. 
at the Ooh, pro she knows the month <laughs> at the pro gymnastics challenge one of the many attempts at making professional gymnastics happen much like fetch it has not taken off yet <laughs> the coach of team blubbity blub was team usa was nastia the coach of team world was legendary boganskaya the gymnast was oklahoma legend brie olsen she got on the single rail because they had that instead of bothering with the nonsense with the uneven parallel bars and she did a delchev everyone could tell it was delchev even though it was kind of a funky camera angle and she dismounted with a double a out full it was beautiful she was done and um and then we there was some controversy she was mm. not given the points that we thought she would be given we thought for sure team usa was going to take the lead nastia's team because obviously it's a delchev we don't see delchevs all the time and so we get very excited because they're very fun a delchev is when you take off one direction and then you're like fakie just kidding half turn straddle catch the bar through your legs haha -ha, it was a delchev so we hear you can barely hear the conversation between the gymnasts going on in the background, but we hear it was a Delchev said very emphatically to a Boganskaya who is incredulous for Team World. Then we hear again, it was a Delchev. And now there's some looking around, there's some arguing. Then we get a, the shot goes wide. We see Nastia with her arms up in the air. There's a gesture and there's a hair flick. Which yes. are both essential aspects of it was a Delchev. You cannot just exclaim it was a Delchev. You have to do hands and you have to flick your hair. Disgustedly. It was, it was a moment and the look on oh the hair flick. The look on Nastia's face. How can you not recognize a Delchev? What are mm -hmm. we doing here? And then there's even more hair flipping. It was so exciting. It's the kind of thing we've been waiting for. We want all of the judges and the gymnasts and their coaches to be mic'd up on the floor so we can hear them yelling at each other. My, okay, maybe it's just me. I want there basically to be like a sports ball situation with the judges and coaches and gymnasts yelling at each other on the floor because we know that's what they're really thinking, but we're supposed to pretend that, you know, gymnastics is not as competitive and we're all very polite, but inside we know you want to yell. It was a Delchev. So Nastia in this moment embodied all of our feelings, all the times you've yelled at the TV, every time you have told the trio on NBC your real feelings, every time that a Carol has done your gymnast in injustice, it was a Delchev! And mm. that's what it was a Delchev stands for. Is I, I have a I... slightly different memory of what transpired in this competition. Oh, tell me. Air quotes for I was under the impression that this round was like a, like Simon Says kind of round where a gymnast did something on one team and then the gymnast from the other team had to like do it too. And then oh, you might she, be right. like Brie Olsen did a Delchev and then Boganskaya's team was like, you can do a ginger. And then Nastia was like, you can't do a ginger. That's not the same thing. It was a Delchev. And that's where it came from. You might but, be right. You know, these are the kind of arguments that gym nerds get into. That's right. This is gym, if you need gym nerd school, this is misremembering the format of a fake competition that ended in a tie. Look how that worked out from seven years ago where everyone had to wear sports bras because it's like cool. Because that's what you do when you're a professional. You mm -hmm. don't wear a whole leotard. You just wear the top and the bottom. Everybody knows that, Spencer. Oh. Good, good times. Um, so also, Brie Olsen had the best double layout full twist oh, in the history of college gymnastics. Oh my god! And it was so That's beautiful here to too. And we also got Blaine Wilson uh, <laughs> coaching, spotting, which I appreciated very much. So the last um, thing we have to talk about is we had a question about the legend of um, Panor's leotards and specifically. <laughs> why why amazing end of answer <laughs> why do you always talk about her dominatrix leotards it's a dominatrix le well let's look at this retrospective so you know romania has team leotards right but panor only wore black 
and that was her uniform. And she didn't just... As an just... individual. I mean, in the team competitions, yeah. you all have to wear the same. But... Right. But when it was up to her, she always wore dominatrix black. And why do we call her a dominatrix black? Because it's obvious, you guys. I don't need to explain that. So first of all, she had leotards that had like lace, a lace situation in the back. They, oh, she was doing cutouts before cutouts were cool. And I don't mean a t- shoulder cutouts, um, but I mean like nude before the boobitard. She had the nude sides happening with the mesh. She had a fake sparkle belt situation only done in rhythmic gymnastics that i know it of until uh panor did it black was her thing and her style was you know the beam obeys me as mm-hmm. right so um we it is just our assumption that this is why she wore these it is her aesthetic <laughs> it's just her st- yeah it is and it's also the way she attacks and commands her events she is not a delicate gymnast she is not careful she is not she goes for it a hundred percent and the The apparatus needs a safe word when ponor is on it (laughs) and you know that just by the leotard she walks up in even before she's done her gymnastics and so you have to respect the style and what it says about the intentions of the artist as in artistic gymnastics, who wears it. And that is the legend of Panor's dominatrix leotards. So uh, if you guys have enjoyed our presentation for Gym Nerd School, <laughs> you've enjoyed, if you've watched along and you've enjoyed Spencer wearing a tie because it's we're in school. school. Yeah. And he's our professor. Um, then send us more questions. We're going to do a series of these. So it's gymcastic at gmail.com. Um, if you enjoy the work we've done here, if you learn something as this educational series, I've mentioned 175 times educational series um, <clears throat> that, um, that we've done here and you want to support us, uh, check out at gymcastic.com, the uh, club gym nerd tab, join the club tab. And it's as little as a, uh, as uh, four ninety nine a month, and you help us bring this amazing, amazing content to the world. So you can find us uh, every week, Gymcastic, on all of the podcast listening devices, all the apps. Um, you can find us on social media. We're Gymcastic on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And um, I am O to the Burn on the social. Spencer is the BB situation. Again, if you want to check out the clickable code of points, go to the thebalancebeamsituation.com. And uh, thank you, everybody, who uh, supported this show. And um, any final words of advice for the no. new, the budding gym nerd? <laughs> Uh, just random just watch a lot of gymnastics <laughs> that's right. the answer for things like how do i count twists mm, watch 50 million twisting passes and then you'll just kind of know what it looks like when someone does two and then three. screen capture and watch them in slow motion this is the other tip i do a lot of that um thanks you guys so much i hope you guys enjoyed this series and um thanks all for your support and thanks for listening see you guys next week